So welcome everybody to tonight's uh, session with Dr. Adam Rutenberg from George Washington University. Um, he's going to share information with us about how to interact with their service if you do have an emergency offshore and various um, things to watch out for, including how to approach COVID and that situation. So um, we'll let him get started in just a sec here. A few uh, just organizational details. Feel free to ask questions either in the chat or in the Q&A tab, and I will field those um, and bring them to Dr. Rudenberg um, at the appropriate opportunities. Um, so you can either message the everybody or you can message just the host and panelists directly. And either way, I will make sure your questions get answered as best as possible. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Rittenberg, if you could take it away. Okay, thanks a lot, Corey. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here, so just give me a moment. All right, does everybody see the uh, full screen there? Looks good. Okay, so let me just jump right into this. Let me start with an introduction uh, for myself. So who am I? So my name's Adam Rutenberg. I'm a board certified emergency physician. I'm a assistant professor of emergency medicine at George Washington University in Washington, DC. So I'm an attending doctor in the emergency department here. We also staff the Washington DC VA Medical Center. So those are two sites that I work at clinically. And I'm very heavily involved with our telemedicine programs here. So uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about maritime medical access on the next slide. Uh, but I serve as the quality improvement director for our maritime medical access program. And uh, also I'm a tall ship sailor. Um, uh, so this is me here up on this yard. I always like to you know, put in a little plug uh, when I do these discussions. So a uh, little, little jealous that you all get to go sailing while I you know, have to stay back here and work in the ER and field calls. Uh, so uh, who are we? So GW Maritime Medical Access uh, is a program in our Department of Emergency Medicine that was founded in 1989. So we're uh, a pretty longstanding program. And we provide 24 seven, 365 medical advice uh, to vessels, aircraft and remote locations around the world. So our core business and the way we were started was in maritime and we branched out to do uh, telemedicine for private aviation, a lot of remote research teams, uh, really anywhere in the world. We've taken calls from, uh, you know, Antarctica, uh, you know, every ocean, uh, everywhere, everywhere you can imagine. Uh, we're all board certified practicing academic emergency medicine physicians and we have clients basically in every sector of the maritime industry. So uh, we cover large, uh, cargo vessels, we cover research vessels, we cover fishing vessels, we cover private yachts, uh, large and small, um, and we provide medical and logistical and operational support uh, around the clock to these clients. Uh, and then who are we connected to? So we're part of George Washington University Department of Emergency Medicine, as I mentioned. Uh, we're the seventh academic emergency medicine department in the United States. So in the late seventies, our department was founded as a unique department. Uh, we have operations in several countries around the world, and uh, we travel as well to do training. Um, and we have a, uh, a, a section uh, we, which we call Innovative Practice, which runs our telemedicine and mobile health operations programs, including maritime medical access. So the Pacific Cup, you all probably know a little bit more about it than I do, uh, but uh, race from San Francisco to Hawaii about eight to 15 days at sea. And uh, I think we're gonna have around 70 boats uh, with crews of two or more people. Um, the picture on the uh, right there is a picture I took myself in a vacation right before the COVID pandemic. So <laughs> hopefully get an opportunity to get back there at some point. Uh, so why am I here? Well, the reason that I'm here is to try to give you all a little bit of a background on what we do, how to contact us and interact with us, and also how to prepare yourself. Because at, at some point, somebody is gonna be here and potentially run into an issue. And you know, if you're on a small boat and you have limited resources, one of the last things you want is to be unprepared for medical emergency. Um, and our goal is to bring some medical expertise out to you when you need us. So brief outline, 
uh, of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to go through preparation, and preparation is really, um, you know, really I think 80 to 90 percent of the work in managing a medical emergency. Understanding what you might face, what you might need to face those uh, you know, to face those emergencies. I'm going to go through a little bit of uh, potpourri, talking about some specific medications and some things that you might want to bring along. Um, training that might be worth considering before you go if you don't have any training uh, in uh, medical emergency management. Um, and then I'm going to go through uh, a little bit of the particulars about how to have a telemedicine encounter at sea, when you might want to call us, why you might want to call us, and how you should prepare for that call uh, or email. Um, I, I will say that, you know, in one hour, we can't really go through uh, the full scope of preparation. We can't really go through every piece of equipment or medication that every vessel might need or every you know, piece of training. The, the goal here is really not to provide emergency medical training, but just to give you an idea of what's out there. So I'm gonna start by saying that the most important thing is before you go to see, go and see your doctor. Um, uh, this is St. Elsewhere, I kind of like this. It's actually a very good medical show. I was uh, a little kid and I remember my parents watching it when I was, you know, five years old, my father was a doctor and I, uh, I, I uh, thought it would be kind of fun to throw this in here. But um, before you go in preparation for your voyage, go and see your doctor. So make an appointment to see your doctor probably about three weeks or a month before you go away. And really have a, a heart to heart with your doctor about what, uh, what it is that you're gonna be doing. So, you know, explain the nature of your voyage, let your doctor know what the you know, conditions are gonna be that you're gonna be sailing under, uh, how long you're gonna be offshore and encourage anyone on your crew to do the same thing. Get a full physical, get lab work. The other thing that we often ask people to do is have an EKG. Uh, that's a really good baseline test. It's something that as people, you know, basically anyone over the age of 40 should have an EKG on file somewhere because we always wanna know if an EKG is taken, if something has changed. Um, make sure you go over your medications with your doctor and get refills on all your medications. Uh, you don't wanna be caught without uh, a needed medication. And then the other thing, and this is really important, is get that rash lump or other nagging issue checked out. So a lot of people will have maybe a little shortness of breath, maybe a funny rash or a lump on their neck, and it's been bothering them for a few weeks or a few months, and they're, you know, they think, oh, okay, I'll get to it. Well, the last thing you wanna happen is to be a thousand miles from anywhere and that nagging problem that's been bothering you, um, you know, somehow suddenly explodes and becomes a bigger problem. You also wanna get a medical summary for each crew member. Um, now this sometimes can be a little difficult. I think uh, a lot of people who are sailing probably are friends, probably know each other, but people still have confidential medical information. When you go to sea with someone, this is really not the time to hide a medical problem. Um, you know, even if it's a medical problem that you might think of as being something that's a little embarrassing. Now, what I like to say is you don't have to tell your skipper, uh, you know, every, you know, about every rash you have and about every medication you take. But at the very least, you should have been checked out and cleared by a doctor and you should have this information with you. So what we recommend is that everybody put uh, a medical summary together. Uh, can be confidential, should be laminated so that it's waterproof, ideally on a single sheet. And then what you can do is put those in a sealed envelope and you can give that to the skipper or skippers can you know, collect those, never have to open them. And if there's no problem at the end of the voyage, you take it and you burn it and you know, nobody knows. But if you ever call us, this is information that we're gonna to wanna to know as physicians treating. So these should have name, date of birth, a comprehensive list of each person's medical problems, any prior surgeries that they've had, any medications that they're taking on a regular basis, any allergies that they might have, and then that copy of the EKG. If you're gonna bring medications along, uh, make sure that you know uh, that they're unexpired. So this comes back to getting refills, so those blood pressure medications, those diabetes medications, uh, making sure that they're up to date, uh, making sure they're in waterproof containers, and then quantity. You wanna make sure that you have, you know, at least enough for your anticipated voyage, plus anywhere from 25 to 50% more. Um, 
if you have to turn around at any point, if you have to divert, you don't want to ever find yourself in a situation where you need a blood pressure medication and you don't have it with you. Um, uh, then the other thing is medical equipment. A lot of people will have a medical kit aboard their boat and they buy it and they you know, put it in a locker somewhere and hopefully never need it. But the time to find out that the batteries are dead in your pulse oximeter or the medications have gotten wet and dissolved is not the time when you need them. So just as with any other important safety equipment on your boat, you wanna make sure that everything is up to date, recently inspected uh, and working properly and that all medications are in date and usable. Uh, this really comes down as well to communications equipment. So if you have a satellite phone, make sure that you know how to use it, that you've tested it, uh, that it's, uh, your subscription is up to date. And uh, you know, if you need any kind of a backup communication method, it's important to have that too. Now I'm gonna get to this in a little bit, but we are technology agnostic. So we'll take an email, we'll take a call on a satellite phone, we'll take a call from the telemedicine kit. Um, we, we can do video chats if necessary when people are at sea. We often like to do that to get an exam or we'll get, you know, we'll ask for pictures of an eye injury or a rash or, uh, you know, any other issue. Um, and sometimes these phones uh, with um, uh, internet access can actually connect to certain kinds of medical kits uh, to pass information along like temperature, pulse oximeter. Some of the more advanced kits out there can actually uh, take EKGs. Um, and then consider taking a, a first aid course. So I'm not here really to recommend any specific courses, but there are a lot of them out there. There are a lot of first aid at sea courses. I think in a case like this, where you're going to have doctors backing you up, the knowledge is probably less important than the skills and the basic understanding of how to use that knowledge when it's passed on to you. So one of the things that you'll get in a lot of these courses is an opportunity to try splinting a fractured limb, um, you know, understand how to do sutures or basic wound care. So that as we talk you through something like that, if it's necessary, you've had a little bit of experience and you're up to date. Uh, the other thing is that it's good to know how many people, so who on the vessel has taken a first aid course and uh, who has what knowledge. I'm, I'm sure some of the people who will be sailing on this race probably are doctors, nurses, maybe physical therapists, other kinds of medical personnel. So it's always good to know who knows what on the boat, who's brought what on the boat. Um, and um, uh, it's always good to have someone with, you know, more than one person on board who's had both medical training, but also communications training. Because if the person who's ill or injured is the only one who knows how to use the sat phone or the only one who knows how to administer first aid, then um, that person is gonna be in trouble uh, if they get hurt. Uh, we often get asked the question, should I take an AED on board? And th this is kind of a controversial question. Uh, the reason it's a controversial question is because although it's been shown that in cardiac arrest situations, uh, early defibrillation um, and good quality CPR are the two things that most lead to good outcomes. Uh, these studies have all been done in places like airports or big cities where definitive care is very close by. And strictly speaking, if cost is no object, there's no reason not to have a defibrillator on board. But if somebody has a cardiac arrest and is resuscitated with a defibrillator, but then can't get to definitive care, the likelihood of having a good, you know, a good outcome is still lower. And the issue with these is that they're expensive. They require batteries to be charged. They have to be up to date. So it's something to think about when you think about your first aid budget. Uh, this is not necessarily uh, the, the, the number one piece of equipment that's necessary. Um, so I do have to talk about the, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Um, so, uh, have a, so one of my last uh, points here is already showing, but have a COVID plan. So, you know, on a big ship, you've got a station bill. Um, it tells everyone where to go and what to do in an emergency. You know, if you have a fire, flood, man overboard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the point being that you, you want to pre-plan for any emergency and COVID-19 is really no different. 
Um, the number one thing that I think is most important is that all crew on board should be vaccinated. Um, then the second most important thing is that all crew should be vaccinated. And the third most important thing is that all crew should be vaccinated. Um, this is really critical. Um, I don't want to spend too, too much time on COVID-19. I know everybody is probably so sick of hearing about it. And we, you know, fortunately right now in the United States are in a fairly good place, but we don't know exactly where we're going to be, in, you know, come July. And, uh, you know, a lot of us in the medical community think we probably are going to have some resurgence. Um, you know, although the Omicron variant vaccines have been less effective in preventing illness from the Omicron variant, they've still been extremely effective in presenting in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. So if you're offshore, you don't have access to definitive medical care, um, knowing that your crew is vaccinated is really a great shield against having a bad outcome if COVID-19 finds its way aboard the vessel. So that said, the best way to avoid issues from COVID-19 is to not allow SARS-CoV-2 on the vessel in the first place. So if you know you're gonna be offshore for one to two weeks, really important to um, take precautions in the days and probably, you know, probably the seven to 10 days before you go, uh, before you go offshore. Um, probably not the time to go to that huge party or that big, you know, super busy bar with no masks and a bunch of people you don't know, um, because you, you really don't want to put yourself at risk before you go, uh, before you go offshore. Uh, you know, pre-travel quarantine and testing, I mean, this is something that early in the pandemic was absolutely critical uh, because COVID-19 pre-vaccine would just tear through ships. Um, and, and get people sick. And so we would want to test people and have them quarantined before going uh, offshore. I still think it's really worth, uh, strongly worth considering getting a test before you go offshore, unless you've had COVID-19 within the last, you know, within the 90 days prior um, and, and making the decision not to go if you are, uh, if you're sick. Uh, and then COVID-19 tests are a good thing to have on the ship. So people get, still get upper respiratory viruses, they get strep throat, uh, they get other things that sort of, you know, rip around in a small space. And so just having those tests on board can really give you peace of mind to know that, you, you know, you can rule this out. And if somebody calls with upper respiratory symptoms, one of the first things we're going to ask is, are there COVID-19 tests on board? Can you minister tests to the people who are sick? Um, another thing I think I'll talk about just briefly, which I don't have on the slides here, is oxygen, because this has been a question that's been asked uh, frequently throughout the pandemic. Is it worth bringing oxygen tanks on board? Uh, similarly to AEDs, there's probably not a lot of value to bringing supplemental oxygen with you. So a couple things to consider. Uh, oxygen tanks can potentially be dangerous. They have to be appropriately stored. Uh, if they breach, they can be explosive, although that is extraordinarily rare. Uh, oxygen also in a closed environment um, increases fire risk, uh, flammability. The amount of oxygen that you could normally carry on a small boat, uh, even under high pressure, is not going to give you more than a few hours or days of supplemental oxygen. So if somebody needs supplemental oxygen, um, the, the, the goal is to try to get them off as quickly as possible. So carrying large amounts of oxygen probably is not going to help you. Uh, you would need a tremendous amount of, you, you basically you would need very, very large tanks to last uh, for seven days at sea. If anybody's interested in learning more about COVID-19, um, we have on our website, which is right there, a uh, COVID-19 uh, maritime guidance document. And uh, we wrote this at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, probably March of 2020, and we've updated it uh, roughly on a quarterly basis since then, you know, so it talks about uh, background on the virus, um, you know, details on tests, treatments, um, and then really goes into specific recommendations about keeping co uh, COVID off the ship, what to do if you get a COVID case on board, um, and how to manage that. So I'm actually gonna pause here and see if anybody has any questions about anything that I've talked about so far before I move on to the next section, which is medical tidbits. We don't have any questions currently posted. Okay. Um, so I think you can carry on. I'll give everybody a second, but yeah. Okay. 
So medical tidbits. So one thing to consider is uh, purchasing a medical kit. Uh, you know, just as with training, I'm not here really to recommend a specific company or a specific kit. But I will say that the nice thing about these kits is that they're a one-stop shop. Most of them are set up to be sold by the duration of voyage and the size of your crew. So if you know you're gonna be offshore for two weeks and you've got a crew of four people, a lot of these companies have gone to great lengths to make recommendations around what they think you should carry. Um, and so you can obtain medications, you can obtain supplies by buying these, uh, sh uh, these kits. And then you know if you buy it, it's gonna be up to date. Um, what these don't often come with is prescription medications. So let me talk about that for a minute. Uh, let me talk about, I actually specifically want to talk about antibiotics. So for a relatively short duration trip, people are going to have their own medications for things like blood pressure, diabetes, any chronic medical conditions they have. You know, people have thyroid problems, they're going to have their own medications. The, the medications that we find that are most often needed that people are not already on are antibiotics because some sort of an infection has, has come up. Um, the things that we see a lot of are uh, not, not that surprising, actually. You know, we see things like urinary tract infections, pneumonia. Um, we do actually see a lot of skin and soft tissue infections in the maritime environment. And that actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. People are working with their hands. They're walking bare feet. You get uh, cuts on your hand, cut on your arm. You get a cut on your foot. Uh, the skin might stay wet. It can really get exposed to a lot of bacteria in the environment. So we see skin and soft tissue infections. The other thing we actually see a surprising amount of is um, eye infections and dental infections. So uh, pink eye can, can really spread throughout uh, ships. Um, and we do see a lot of dental infections. Now, this sort of varies by population. So in cargo ships and fishing vessels that are, are more common uh, because people have poor dentition, if you're somebody that has uh, crowns, bridges, um, you know, maybe hasn't seen the dentist in a while, it's really worth seeing a dentist as well before you go offshore um, to get that dental work checked, to get that cleaning. Um, because dental infections can, they're, they're almost completely avoidable with good hygiene um, and, uh, you know, good maintenance of dental work. But they can, in some cases, be hard to treat, and they can actually, in some cases, be very dangerous if they spread down into the deeper spaces in the neck. Um, so one reason why you would call us is if you ever think that you need to use any antibiotic that you're carrying. Um, we, we tell people never, ever start antibiotics uh, without talking to a doctor. Don't take your uh, you know, your wife's antibiotic, your friend's antibiotic, don't grab that three-year-old doxycycline that's been in the back of the medicine cabinet for, uh, for all that time and take it with you. Um, because certain medications can actually be harmful if they're expired. And the other thing is that if you give the wrong antibiotic, not only are you going to not help, but you might potentially cause harm. The other thing is that these are not benign medications. They do have side effects. Some of them, for example, make the, your skin very sun sensitive. And so this is, not this is an environment where you really wanna think about that. <clears throat> Any antibiotic that somebody's never taken, really need to think about the allergy profile because if there's an adverse reaction or if there are interactions with other medications. So this is why, again, it's very important that everybody on board have a list of their medications and know what they're taking so that uh, if we have to think about giving somebody an antibiotic, um, uh, what they, uh, what they, uh, what interactions that might have with the medications they're, they're taking. Uh, the other thing is how much to carry, how often to take it, how long the course is. These are all different by infection. So then the question becomes, well, if I'm going to get an antibiotic, how do I do that? Uh, skippers of ships can actually go to marine suppliers and buy antibiotics without prescriptions. Um, but truthfully, the easiest thing to do is if you think you want to have a small cache of antibiotics on board your boat, um, most many family doctors will go and just write a prescription and then you can go pick up the medication. Um, it is a little bit of a crapshoot what to have. Usually on larger vessels, we recommend, uh, you know, a cache of anywhere from seven to 10 different antibiotics. Um, some of the most useful antibiotics um, are um, something called Keflex or Cephalexin um, or Augmentin. You guys have probably heard of these before. Um, you, you can feel free to send some follow-up emails if you have any questions about this. 
but these are antibiotics that will treat tooth infections, skin infections, pneumonia, really just about anything. Uh, not literally anything, but um, very versatile. Um, if you have, need to carry two uh, or you want to carry three, there are some other additional antibiotics that can be carried, um, uh, things like doxycycline, Bactrim, uh, metronidazole. Um, but the other thing that I might recommend that you ask your doctor about is um, something for pink eye. So, um, you know, talking to your doctor and saying, I'd like to carry some uh, ointment for pink eye, and they can make recommendations uh, for something for you to carry. Let me actually stop here and see if questions, if people have any questions about antibiotics, because that's often a topic people want to know about. Or is, has anyone raised their hand or asked a question? I haven't gotten any questions about antibiotics yet. Um, or anything else, as long as we're following. The, the three questions I have, let me know if you are going to answer these later. But um, first question was, should we carry a pulse oximeter and blood pressure meter? Mm -hmm. Potentially in response to the COVID-19 material. Yeah, so getting basic vital signs is, is really important, no matter what, COVID-19 or not. So thermometer, a blood pressure monitor, uh, you know, a blood pressure cuff, um, if you know what to do, you know, blood pressure cuff and stethoscope, uh, or else an automatic blood pressure monitor, and then a pulse oximeter, which will give you both pulse and pulse ox. Uh, we will ask for vitals. And most medical kits will have all of these things. The other thing is uh, carrying a stethoscope too, because we can um, guide you in the use of a stethoscope. Um, uh, you know, believe it or not, even a lay person with some proper instruction can give some useful information in certain situations. Um, what's the next question? Um, the next question was whether you would recommend carrying prescription pain medication. That's a really good question. So I'm going to actually I'm going to actually uh, hold that off until the next slide because I'm going to talk a little bit about pain medication. Okay. Um, I think there were some specific questions about antibiotics. Cypro, Cephadroxyl. Uh, you mean as to so Cipro? Cipro, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, uh, Cipro has its place on board. Um, it's probably lower on the priority list. Um, it's not one of the more frequently used antibiotics on board. It can be used for urinary tract infections, prostate infections, which we do see from time to time, sometimes in older men. Um, uh, so, yeah, did... Both of, the, both of those medications probably would be lower on the priority list. Those are both in the category of they might be really useful, but it's hard to know until you get there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly the case. Uh, yeah. You're, we're sort of playing, if you're going to carry antibiotics, you're sort of playing the numbers on what you're most likely to see and most likely to need. And the other thing is that um, ability to evacuate or to get to shore really plays a role in what you know, how far down the priority list you would go. So, for example, uh, you know, sometimes we work with um, cable laying ships, which, you know, have tremendous difficulty um, if they're laying cable, cutting the cable and dropping the cable and then going off station and then coming back and finding the cable later. So um, that's not really the case here. Um, you know, it's a little easier for you to be mobile. So probably less critical to go down the, um, the uh, you know, down the, farther down the list. One more person asked about Ceftin. They said they were given a prescription for Ceftin to use a broad spectrum to cover UTI, URI, and skin. Yeah, that's actually also a very, a very good medication. It'll cover uh, UTI. It'll cover UTI and really upper UTI and complicated UTI. So uh, that would be like kidney infections, pyelonephritis. Um, so that, that, that is uh, a fairly versatile medication as well. Is that a reasonable prescription to carry as a single broad spectrum antibiotic? Probably it would not be my first choice, uh, but if this person already has it, it would be reasonable. I think for specific questions like this, I'm actually gonna have some contact information at the end. So if people want to follow up, um, you know, they're welcome to do that. Okay. Um, we have two non-antibiotic questions left in the queue. One was whether you would recommend taking nitroglycerin. 
It's an interesting question. We do, we do have that sort of broadly on our list. Um, I think it depends on the context. If this is somebody that already has anginal pain, they definitely should bring nitroglycerin with them. Um, it's probably not that useful uh, as an intervention in most cases. So for example, the places where we're most often gonna use that are uh, pain if somebody has an MI. So not, not very likely that somebody's gonna have a heart attack. Um, and while it doesn't, uh, while it does improve pain, it doesn't improve survivability or outcomes. And the other thing is, because it drops blood pressure in certain kinds of heart attacks, it's, act it's actually contraindicated. So we typically wouldn't use it until we have an EKG. Um, the other situation that we would use it would be to lower blood pressure acutely um, in certain types of medical situations that we see in the emergency department that are very unlikely to occur on a, on a sailing vessel with people who are reasonably healthy. Um, in other words, you know, people who are gonna be out on these boats most likely are not on dialysis. They don't have extremely high uncontrolled blood pressure. So um, not, not necessarily a medication that I would prioritize having. Um, Brandon Mercer suggests, and maybe this is a question you can give some feedback on, but do you think that um, phone apps that can do like pulse oximetry measurements, is that an appropriate stand-in for a dedicated device? Well, so a, um, what I would actually recommend is having a dedicated device. They're so cheap. They're about $35. Um, any phone app, I, I'm not actually aware of a phone app that can do a pulse oximetry uh, without, I mean, it's a dedicated sensor. Now, newer Apple watches do have a pulse oximeter, but it's not approved. It's not actually an FDA approved medical device. And so the accuracy is, is questionable. Um, but even these cheap little, you know, $35 devices that, that pinch onto the finger, um, are approved and accurate. So I would recommend just having that, the actual device. Great. Um, the last question I have queued up is whether you have any suggested vendors for medical kits. I know you sort of dodged that question already, but I'm, I'm going to continue to dodge that question <laughs> actually. So yeah, I'm not, I, unfortunately, I mean, we, you know, there's a lot out there and if anybody has a specific question, I think it's fine to send a follow-up email, but I, I don't want to, you know, drive people toward any particular vendor or, or any particular kit. It, it really is circumstantial, circumstance specific. Okay. And finally, maybe you could just, um, one more time, recommend your general first and second choice for broad spectrum antibiotics to carry. Yeah, I think I think that if I was carrying one antibiotic, it would probably be uh, either Augmentin or Keflex, uh, one or the other. Um, uh, I might add um, either Bactrim or Doxycycline onto that um, as a second choice which if there are any doctors on board would give you MRSA coverage. Um, yeah, so uh, probably Keflex, um, Keflex Bactrim would be my top two. Great, thanks. I think that does it for now. Okay. Um, so talking a little bit about pain control. So uh, analgesic. So I'm talking about uh, over the counters, but I'll talk about prescription medications as well. So ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, uh, they're really all the same. Uh, you know, they're, they're different words for sort of the same active medication. Um, Tylenol and Motrin, uh, they do work a little differently. They are different risk profiles uh, with each. Um, Tylenol is metabolized through the liver. So if somebody has liver damage, uh, liver disease, or you know, if people are doing heavy drinking or any drinking, Tylenol is not a great option. And then Motrin is um, uh, potentially damaging to the kidneys. Really the important thing is to, um, uh, to make sure that you're taking the appropriate amount of medication. So, um, you know, ibuprofen or Motrin, for example, is generally going to be given in doses between 400 and 800 milligrams, and there's the pain control dosing and, um, and uh, anti-inflammatory dosing, but more is not necessarily better. So, you know, if a doctor says take 600 or a doctor says take 800, 
and you're still in pain, don't then you know take another 400 or another 800. Um, uh, that can uh, potentially be damaging to the kidneys. The other thing about ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin um, is these potentially can all have an effect on bleeding um, and thin the blood. Um, can I take Motrin with Tylenol? That's a question that's often asked. You, you actually can. Um, usually what we do is recommend uh, uh, alternating them. So if somebody is really having significant pain that's not controlled by one or the other, um, taking Tylenol and then four hours later taking Motrin and then four hours later taking Tylenol and four hours later taking Motrin so that you're taking them every eight hours, but you're offsetting that so that you're putting a new medication in every, uh, every four hours. And we do recommend tapering off as quickly as possible. As far as which one is best to take, it really depends. Uh, I think that it, um, Motrin is going to have a little bit more of an anti-inflammatory effect for you. Um, uh, so, you know, we like to use that if there's swelling, um, the pain control is also, also multimodal. So if you have an orthopedic injury, uh, don't, um, don't underestimate the importance of elevating the tissue so that the edema can go away and icing the, you know, icing the injury, uh, to really help the swelling go down. Um, and with reduction in swelling comes reduction in pain. Um, some work for, one person and some work for another person um, and some people have preferences. So there's really no best one to take. Um, I think these are low cost. It's reasonable to have both of them. And then if you call us, we will, you know, we can talk to you about a regimen to take. Now, what about uh, prescription pain medications? So I, I will actually tell you that these are used incredibly rarely on ships. Um, we've found that, uh, you know, unless there are cases of really major trauma, we don't find that we've needed, uh, you know, um, narcotic pain medications, you know, like oxycodone, Percocet, et cetera. Um, a lot of these, uh, it's, if you are going to carry something with you, uh, make sure you know exactly what it is, because a lot of these uh, products uh, have multiple medications in one pill. So Percocet, for example, has oxycodone, but it also has Tylenol. And it's important to know that because we don't want anyone to overdose on Tylenol. And it does happen that people are prescribed oxycodone. They don't realize what they're, or, or excuse me, they're prescribed Percocet. They don't realize what they're taking. They take Tylenol with it and they wind up overdosing on Tylenol. The other thing about these medications is um, there are, you know, specific requirements as far as handling. Um, you can't get, uh, so even for a Marine supply house, if you're a captain, you can't just walk in and get a, um, get a, uh, a, um, you know, and just buy oxycodone off the shelf. Like you can with certain other medications, you do actually need a prescription and, or a medical director specifically for your vessel. Um, you definitely want to keep these medications. They do have potential for abuse. Um, so, you know, if by chance you've obtained them, you want to obtain them appropriately and legally and keep them under lock and key. And the only person who should be making the decision about when that key comes out is uh, going to be, uh, you know, typically a, the skipper or the medical officer, which in many cases is one and the same on a smaller boat. Um, as I said, we use them rarely. So I don't, I don't feel that they're a critical medication to have on board. Um, I did have a question. Um, Somebody asked about naproxen sodium versus ibuprofen. Yeah, so uh, same medication class. We don't usually use both. Uh, naproxen will often use because uh, it's uh, less frequent dosing. And so that's a perfectly reasonable alternative to uh, ibuprofen. And is there any difference between ibuprofen and Motrin? Is Motrin just a brand name? So, yeah, they're the same medication. It's a brand name. Great. Yeah, what I what I always do actually, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mention um, combination products actually on I think on a different slide. But whenever you go to a drugstore and you pick up a, a medication, it's uh, best thing to do is to really look at the back and see what the active ingredients are. And there are a lot of combination medications out there, things that'll have you know like Dayquil that'll have a cough medicine and an expectorant and Tylenol all in the same uh, pill, and those are reasonable to use in certain situations, but it's, you just wanna know what's in the medication. And uh, for me personally, I like to, uh, if I'm gonna carry multiple medications, I actually like to buy them and carry them as single medication products because I know 
you know, what I can mix and what I can take together. Um, and you may not, but it, you know, at least for the purposes of this race, if you call us uh, and you need symptom control or pain control, we can go through what you have on your boat um, and uh, make recommendations for what to take based on that. Um, so what about seasickness meds and other meds for GI upset? So, uh, you know, people have heard a lot of these things, meclizine, scopolamine, Zofran, Benadryl, these actually all work for seasickness. Uh, Zofran um, is a very common anti-nausea medication uh, that, that actually is less effective for seasickness. It's a, um, it, it's a prescription medication, and it's actually one that I think is well worth um, talking to your doctor about and having a few pills on the boat. Um, it's generally a very safe medication, but it, you don't want to use it if people have something called long QT syndrome, um, which is an abnormality on that EKG that I mentioned before. And again, this is why it's really important for everybody to have seen their doctor and to have a baseline EKG. So if you're a two-man crew and you're talking about it and you want to get some anti-nausea medicine, you ask your doctor to write a prescription for Zofran, your doctor should do an EKG first and check. If you're, you know, a six, you know, person or eight person crew, and you just have that medication aboard, having everybody have that EKG aboard is really helpful because then we can just review it um, when necessary. Um, most seasickness or anti nausea medications have some undesirable effects. Um, so they can cause, depending on the medication, they can cause people to be sleepy. Um, they can cause things like dry mouth. They can cause difficulty with urination. Um, and again, um, I keep sort of harping on this, but this is why it's important to know what medical problems you have and talk these things over with your own doctor before you go uh, offshore. So for example, um, you know, certain medications are really less, less ideal to use in somebody who has an enlarged prostate. Um, urinary retention on board, your inability to pee um, is extremely, extremely rare but it does happen and um, it's very uncomfortable, very unpleasant uh, if it happens and can't be relieved in a medical facility and um, potentially over, over a longer period of time can be dangerous as well. The other thing is, you know, what about that pink stuff? You know, what do I take for diarrhea? What do I take for constipation? So um, uh, it's probably reasonable to carry um, you know, to carry both a laxative um, in case you uh, are faced with constipation and also an anti-diarrheal in case you're faced with somebody who has diarrhea. Now, diarrhea is fairly common. It's usually self-limited and short-lived and actually in and of itself, it's not the most dangerous thing as long as people can replace the fluids that they lose. So, you know, just oral rehydration is the most important thing if people have diarrhea but it's uh, reasonable to carry an anti-diarrheal like Imodium um, or a stool softener like Colace um, in case people have diarrhea or constipation. Now, most um, offshore pre-made uh, you know, pre medical kits will have these medications because they are uh, over-the-counter medications. Uh, I already talked about side effects a little bit, um, allergy profile. Uh, you know, each medication is gonna have a different allergy profile and people need to know what allergies they're allergic to. Uh, and then I talked a little bit already about uh, medication cocktails. So, um, you know, combination products. I did have one question. Somebody asked about promethazine for seasickness. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, it's actually a reasonable choice. It, again, it's going to make people sleepy, though. Um, so I think anytime somebody takes a medication for the first time, they really should know uh, how it's going to affect them uh, before they have to be on watch. Um, oftentimes, we'll, we'll recommend that people take a medication, but take it right when they come off watch, uh, you know, right before they're going to go down into their bunk to, to go to sleep um, so that they can understand how it's going to affect them before they have to be alert. Uh, so some first aid must have, so band-aids and antibiotic ointments. So cuts and scrapes happen all the time. They don't always need to be covered, um, on land or in, in most, you know, daily situations, but, um, in a dirty environment in a working environment, it's important to keep those cuts and scrapes clean because you don't want them to get infected. Um, gauze bandages, various splint kits. Uh, so broken fingers are fairly common. Um, broken wrists, broken legs, uh, those do occur, 
but less common. Um, certainly people get thrown down in heavy seas or, you know, trip on, uh, you know, lines or cleats or other hardware that's on the deck. Um, uh, iodine solution to keep things clean. Shears, tweezers, so splinters are reasonably common. Um, tourniquets and cravats. So, um, uh, so cravats are these uh, triangular pieces of fabric. They're used to tie splints on. They're also used to make slings. They're very versatile. Um, tourniquets, um, you know, in, in, in general medical practice are reasonably, um, are, are a little controversial because they do cause limb damage after a very short period of time. Um, it's important to know if you ever have to put a tourniquet on why uh, exactly when the tourniquet is being put on. And hopefully you're in communication with us before you think about using a tourniquet. So when you're offshore, um, if you use a tourniquet and you can't get to definitive medical care within about 30 to 45 minutes, you're already looking at causing limb damage. And any kind of extended use of a tourniquet has the potential to lead to the loss of the limb. That said, if there is uncontrolled bleeding from a severe injury, and your, your only option is a tourniquet, then uh, we would still recommend that a, a tourniquet be used. Um, you know, in, a, in an extreme scenario, loss of limb is probably preferable to loss of life. Now, this is, these are extremely rare. I don't wanna scare anyone. So um, injuries that require you know, tourniquet use are very, very rare. Um, we find actually that they're often not needed and even semi-trained EMS providers, emergency medical services providers uh, will often put them on um, when they may not be entirely necessary. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, another good trick is if you have a blood pressure cuff and you need a sort of a temporary tourniquet, um, you can actually put a blood pressure cuff on a limb and pump it up and you can occlude a vessel that way and that will slow bleeding down. Um, one of the things that's probably pretty important also is knowing who on your crew is on a blood thinner. Probably some people will be on uh, blood thinners, maybe Coumadin or Xarelto. Um, there are various indications for these. Um, it's important to know because that they do inc uh, increase bleeding risk. Um, the other thing is allergic reactions and asthma. So we do see allergic reactions from time to time. Um, carrying an EpiPen uh, is uh, a great, uh, an EpiPen is a great tool to have with you. Um, they are a little dangerous. Uh, you don't want to accidentally in inject someone with adrenaline, but if somebody's having a severe or life-threatening allergic reaction, uh, they can usually be used, um, uh, managed with an EpiPen. Now, they're just temporizing, and sometimes in extreme cases, they need to be repeated, but the vast majority of allergic reactions that require epinephrine administration only require one to two doses of epinephrine, um, which means that uh, a, a, a severe reaction can be definitively managed with one to two epipens. Uh, and then Benadryl, albuterol, and then another medication that we uh, recommend people carry is um, uh, some kind of an oral steroid like prednisone. Um, people who have asthma uh, who know they have asthma might want to get a prescription from their primary care doctor to have a short course of uh, burst of steroids with them. Um, and if it's an unknown, um, th this is a reasonable medication to carry. Okay, eyes. So you only have two eyes. Um, eye injuries are actually very common at sea. Um, they're certainly more common in the industrial environment, but there are a lot of things that can cause eye injuries. Um, everything from um, dust and debris blowing in the wind, hitting the eyes, um, to snapped lines, people falling, or you know, people using tools a lot of the time. So um, we'll see sometimes uh, metal shards wind up in people's eyes if they're hammering or grinding, making a repair. Um, and you know, I find that both in the maritime environment and also everywhere in real life, People often don't stop and say, I'm going to put these glasses on, you know, or I'm, I'm going to use this circular saw and I don't know where my glasses are, so I'm just going to do it. It's just one quick cut. Nothing's going to happen. And then um, that's how people injure an eye. Um, it, it's always worth pausing and getting the appropriate uh, safety glasses. The other thing is uh, we sometimes see people wearing inappropriate um, glasses. So if you're working with chemicals, you want to make sure that you have a, a, a splash type goggle 
it goes all the way around the eye as opposed to just a glass as opposed to just glasses and then the other thing is um, specialized uh, specialized eye protection is important so welding for example you need uh, darker UV protection and you want to protect bystanders as well um, people uh, should bring an extra pair of prescription glasses if they wear glasses uh, they do tend you know you, you, you know, we often say that it's, it's just insurance against something happening. If you have a spare pair, nothing's ever going to happen to your primary pair. But if you don't have a spare pair, the primary is going overboard the first day you're offshore. It, it always goes like that. Um, and then contact lenses, save those for shore side. So we really don't recommend people wear contact lenses when they're out at sea. Uh, there's too much potential for infection, for damage, and for other issues to occur with the contact lenses. Um, I'm going to jump into the next section in a minute, uh, which is a little bit more about telemedicine. So let me pause here and see what questions we have. And by the way, I know we're done uh, at uh, seven o'clock your time, but you know I can stay on for a few extra minutes if, if we need to. I don't think we have a hard uh, time cut off. Some people will drop off, but we'll share the recording later. So you know everything you present will be available for everyone to review if they're not able to stay. Okay. Um, the few, we have about four questions up. So first of all, someone asks, um, for someone who doesn't ordinarily get seasick, um, but also just isn't that experienced with going offshore, would it make sense to take seasick medication before departure? And if so, should they start a day or two before? Is there an advantage to that? No, we, we really haven't seen an advantage to that. Um, there are a couple things to consider. So these medications, especially if you're taking them over a longer period of time, can have side effects, undesirable side effects. So if you're not sure what's going to happen, um, then uh, then uh, it's better not to take them until you actually get seasick. Now, once you get seasick, you want to stay ahead of it. A um, couple of things that, that really do help are just light foods, so saltines, um, you know, keeping a little bit of food in the stomach actually is helpful, um, as is being up on deck and keeping eyes on the horizon. Um, you know, people, until they get their sea legs, um, uh, keeping eyes on the horizon and head level. And then the other thing, um, you know, it, I, I, I suspect a lot of people on this call may have been in this situation before, but uh, one of the best things for seasickness is to put your head over the rail and you know, let it go. And people feel a lot better after that, oftentimes. Um, uh, you know, so the medications are good to use, but I wouldn't recommend using them prophylactically. And I'll just add that, you know, it's really great to make sure that you do have some offshore time before you step on a boat for 10 to 15 days, if you're yeah. worried about that stuff. Yeah, I think that's fair. So if you have an opportunity to get offshore for a few days in a less, uh, you know, a less pressured environment, I think that's a very good idea. Um, it's better to be, you know, 300 miles offshore than 1000 miles offshore when you when you first run into a problem. Okay, so a few what to bring questions, um, an IV kit and IV fluids. If you have experience starting IVs, and you have the you know, I'll say the, the money, you know, if it's, if it's reasonable, um, it's, 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 it's not unreasonable to have that. Now that said, it's nowhere near an absolute necessity. Um, we recommend IVs extremely rarely, um, believe it or not. So I mentioned the most common need for rehydration is diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, in most cases, these pass quickly, we can manage vomiting with a medication like Zofran, which I mentioned before, and then people can orally rehydrate. Um, so I would recommend oral rehydration salts, um, you know, which you can uh, dissolve in water and that will help you with uh, replacing electrolyte losses. But, um, uh, you know, IV kit, um, Usually you're not going to carry a lot of fluid. It's going to expire relatively quickly. You have to worry about temperature and storage. Um, and then most people are not, you know, if you've never started an IV, you're not going to be, you're really not going to be able to start one on a rolling boat, um, you know, under guidance in most cases. Um, on that topic, somebody asked some whether Gatorade is a helpful tool for treating dehydration. 
Yeah, it is. Um, we don't usually recommend sort of full strength Gatorade. You can alternate Gatorade with water. Uh, you can um, dilute Gatorade, uh, but it uh, it's a reasonable thing to take. The other thing is a Pedialyte, uh, which uh, tastes terrible. I, I don't know if people have ever tried it, but uh, I've used it with my own children and I've tried it and it's uh, awful, but it is a reasonable uh, rehydration fluid. The nice thing about salt, just taking a dissolvable or rehydration salt, is that it's got a longer shelf life, low weight, doesn't really take up any space. It can go in your kit somewhere and then just get dissolved in water if necessary. All right, other items, sutures, question mark? Good question. Um, if lacerations happen, um, Many that we would typically suture in the emergency department, you may be able to get away without suturing. Um, we have absolutely talked people through doing sutures who have never, um, never sutured in their life. Um, that said, there are some temporary alternatives, things like butterfly closure strips. There are some newer products that are coming out on the market that, um, that allow you to approximate or pull wounds together with various types of, you know, little strings and pulleys, but they're a little exotic and we don't recommend them. Um, the thing about uh, taking sutures with you is that, yeah, when you need them, you need them, but you need them very rarely. They expire. Um, they take up space in a kit. Um, it, I'm, I'm really plus minus on sutures for something like this, truth be told. Um, it's not something that's gonna hurt you to have, but it's probably something that you're most likely not gonna need. And the final question I have here is whether you would take more than one type of anti-emetic medication. Um, probably not. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Zofran is a, is a, a really good tool. Um, it's called Ondansetron is the uh, generic name. Um, and I think for a short trip, that's probably all you would need. Now it's not good for seasickness. So I might separately carry, um, an antihistamine for seasickness there, you know, there's several over the counter products that are used for seasickness. Okay. Thanks. I think we can move on now. Sure. All right. So let's talk about telemedicine a little bit. Uh, so what is telemedicine? So it's remote uh, medical consultation. It can be done. Uh, over the phone, it can be done uh, with face-to-face -face video, but the other thing is it can also be done over email. And actually, actually even though the uh, responses are not uh, you know, as immediate, um, in most cases, uh, an email consultation is, is typically adequate. Um, so why? So have you ever, you know, everyone's probably been on an airplane and had the experience uh, where a doctor needs to get called. Um, there are very limited resources. There may or may not be a doctor. And the, and the point of telemedicine is really to bring some of that expertise. So all of these questions that, um, that we're talking about now, you know, sutures, uh, antiemetics, antibiotics, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of information and um, sort of needed knowledge that underlies managing a lot of these illnesses and injuries. And so the, the goal with telemedicine is really to bring the expertise out to you. Um, yeah, you wanna be prepared with as much equipment as possible within reason, but it means that you can handle situations that you might not otherwise be able to handle on your own. And the other thing is that this can basically occur wherever you are. Um, so with satellite phones, with um, satellite internet connections, uh, there are low bandwidth telemedicine kits out there. Um, you, you, know, you can really get a doctor out to you wherever you are on this world. Now, there are some interesting licensing limitations. Uh, so if you're on shore um, in a location, uh, the, uh, a doctor should have a license in the state where the patient's located. So um, for example, you know, uh, we, we, we have doctors in our group actually who are licensed in various coastal states so that we can cover um, much, of the, you know, much of the coastal states. But this is not an issue if you're offshore. If you're offshore and you're in another country, you can call us um, and get a medical advice. We would generally recommend if you're ashore in California, if you're ashore in Hawaii and you have an issue, then the best thing to do is to go get evaluated locally. Um, 
So let me talk a little bit about this. Uh, so how? So this the information will be shared with you all later, but the key is that if you want to initiate a consult with us, you would either send us an email or call us. And we have a 24 seven operations center uh, that uh, will get your email or take your call in real time. If you send us an email, you'll generally get a response from a physician within about an hour. And if you give us a call, you'll generally have a physician on the line within uh, two to five minutes. Um, you can contact us either way you'd like. Um, you know, we, we would ask you to be a little judicious and, and think about, um, you know, uh, how you might call us depending on the situation. So for example, if somebody is, um, you know, if somebody has a cough, uh, you know, or a cut or a scrape, you know, an email is typically fine, although you certainly can call us. But if anybody is an extremist, um, abnormal vital signs, short of breath, chest pain, uh, any kind of an injury, fall, hypothermia, just pick up the phone call us, you'll, you'll get somebody uh, basically right away. Uh, so who and when, uh, so I'm gonna cover when in a moment, but uh, who basically anyone on the ship can call um, and you, you're gonna get all board, board certified emergency medicine physicians. And actually we don't have, we have a very large physician group in our, in our, at our university, but the doctors who work in this program um, are, are a very small subset actually of that group. And so we always have several doctors on call for Maritime. Um, and they're all people who have, you know, a special interest in telemedicine or remote medicine or Maritime medicine in particular. So the way this would work is you would uh, initiate a consult with the communication center. Um, the physician will join usually within about two minutes and we'll consult with the client. So we'll collect a lot of information. The questions we're always going to ask are um, what other medical conditions does this person have? What medications do they take? What allergies do they have? And then we're going to get into what happened. Um, is it an illness? Is it an injury? What are their symptoms? We're going to do the same kind of interview that we would do if you go to your own doctor's office and ask you the same kind of questions. And then we're going to go through a physical exam as best we can, which might mean we'll, we'll ask you to send pictures. It might mean that we'll guide the, you know, the person calling through an exam on the, on the patient um, and ask them to relate findings to us. Um, we'll make a treatment plan. And then really one of two, there's gonna be one of two possibilities after that. We're gonna follow up as needed. And what we do is whenever we open a case, we follow the case to resolution. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things. So sometimes we um, prescribe a medication, we follow up in five days, the ear infection is gone and we close the case. Sometimes uh, the ship is in an area you know, that has poor medical care. Uh, we can't get them seen ashore and we think they need to be ashore. There are situations where we've, we've followed complex medical cases for um, you know, a month and a half um, if we have to, until we you know, get that person appropriately diagnosed and appropriately treated. Um, if we think that it's something that can't be handled aboard the vessel, then we'll think about an evacuation or a diversion. Um, so we never make those uh, decisions in isolation. We always get a second physician on the line. And in practice, we often have three, four or five doctors conferencing about complicated cases and making decisions about what to do. Can we watch this? Can we treat it? Or do we, um, or do we, uh, do we recommend an evacuation or diversion? Now, we don't ever directly contact the Coast Guard, but we can. Uh, which is to say that the ultimate, you know, you know, we always say the ultimate decision about an evacuation, a diversion, a course, you know, a course change, um, it's up to the skipper. Um, and it's the skipper's, uh, you know, job and responsibility to make the decision to contact the Coast Guard regarding an evacuation. Um, uh, so we'll just make the recommendation and then, you know, it goes on from there. But that said, we can communicate with uh, Coast Guard, uh, with the you know, Coast Guard, in this case, you know, probably the US Coast Guard, um, uh, if we're asked to, and we're happy to call duty stations. And we've, we've done this a lot and we've communicated with foreign nations Coast Guards as well, if requested. Um, and then if there's a diversion, we can do case management. And again, we can follow the case until we know that mariner or that, that crew members uh, ashore. 
Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but uh, the, there are 24-7 call centers, a worldwide emergency communication center. Uh, it's staffed by EMTs and paramedics. There's always, uh, you know, it's, it's always open. Um, it provides us instant access to client information, medical records. Um, we do, you know, for most vessels, um, you know, in this case, it's a little unique because there are a lot of boats and we're probably not going to maintain uh, the med list for every vessel, but we can have that sent to us. Um, but for most of our longstanding large clients, um, we'll, we'll keep their med list on file here. So we'll know what they have. And then we also have a, a database of global medical facilities and, um, you know, we're used to evacuating and communicating with foreign hospitals. Um, the one thing that we don't do, you know, we, we love to do is, is text messaging and things like WhatsApp. And, and we, the, the reason is because of privacy concerns. So we really, you know, we're technology agnostic. We say we're technology agnostic, but we really prefer to use things that are HIPAA compliant. Um, there are uh, companies that uh, put out these sort of comprehensive medical kits I would not recommend getting one of these for this race or for a smaller boat. Um, these usually are carried on board, things like cargo ships, um, which allow us to get telemetry information, EKGs, vital signs very easily and get them transmitted to us. Uh, and we're compatible with Digigon, Tempest. These are some of the companies out there that do that. Um, but I just want you to be aware that, that uh, you know, this is possible if it's something that you have aboard. Um, uh, facts, uh, you know, people kind of laugh at this, but we do still have an old school um, copper twisted pair phone line hooked up to a fax machine. And so we can get faxes if, if necessary. And uh, every year we probably get one or two cases over a fax machine. Um, so the people taking your call, I, I kind of touched on this a little bit. They're all board certified emergency medicine physicians who are dedicated to the maritime program. That's our medical director, Neil Sika. Uh, and he's, he's sitting in our emergency department here. We've got a bank of phones, so one of these will ring. Um, uh, and uh, every now and then, uh, usually the, the doctor who's on, doctors who are on are not actually working in the emergency department, but every now and then a call might go to the emergency department in the middle of the night, just so you're aware, but we do have people on call 24 hours a day. Uh, so when should I call? When is someone sick enough for a call? Um, you know, I, I actually like to say whenever you want, uh, you should call. Uh, but, you know, general rules of thumb, if there's something that makes you nervous, is there something that impacts your mission? Um, when we talk about mission, that might be a little more relevant in a commercial vessel. But, you know, you still have a mission. You're on a race. Um, but are you nervous about something? Do you, you know, somebody has a funny headache and they don't usually get headaches. Somebody has a floater or a flash in their eye. You know, something is up with their vision. They have a funny smell just call us. Um, if you're saying, you know, if you're scratching your head and saying, gee, I don't know, just call us. Nobody is ever going to, um, you know, the only, you know, the only, um, you know, the only problematic question is the question not asked. And we, we really want people to call early and often because in the maritime environment, in a remote environment, a small problem can be managed uh, and if not managed, can potentially balloon into a very big problem. And I can think of examples off the top of my head uh, where, you know, people have had headaches for, you know, three, four days, five days and don't tell the skipper. And then they tell the skipper and then, uh, you know, when it gets really bad and they're throwing up. Um, we have managed remotely everything from, uh, from, you know, cuts and scrapes and, you know, upper respiratory infections to major traumas, strokes, heart attacks, um, and have worked to get people um, taken care of and evacuated. So, uh, you know, we, we'd, we'd rather deal with the problem when it's minor. And if somebody, you know, if somebody has a little twinge in their chest, a little bit of chest pain, just pick up the phone and call us. So how often should I call, you know, whenever you need. And then this point about communication schedules is that once we have a case opened, uh, we'll actually set up a communication schedule. So we'll give you initial recommendations. We'll say, uh, kind of like a follow-up appointment with your own doctor. We'll say, okay, we're gonna check back up on you in 48 hours. We'll usually send an email out requesting a call back or uh, further information. And, um, uh, but we always say, 
you know, if, if, if we open a case and we say, let's talk again in 48 hours, but something changes, we'll tell you to call us if something changes. Um, so, uh, you know, details. Uh, so the race, I believe, is July 4th this year. Uh, with everyone expected to be in by July 18th. And then there's a, the, you know, I, I believe what we've done in past years, and I think what we're going to be doing this year is an individual option to extend. So people who are going to be sailing back to California, um, you know, could have sort of extended coverage. Uh, length of calls as long as you need. And then I think I've already covered this. Uh, think, you know, examples of typical calls, injuries, medication questions, fainting, abdominal pain, shortness of breath. Um, I, you know, I will say, as well, that if this is something, if you are someone who spends a lot of time offshore, uh, if you're a worldwide sailor and this is something that you're interested in as a, as a personal service for your own vessel, um, feel free to go to our website and connect with us. Uh, you know, and uh, there are ways to set up coverage for a vessel outside this race. Um, I'm kind of gonna, you know, I've sort of already talked about this already, what makes us unique, uh, you know, experience, attention, um, you know, dedicated group. Uh, so here is some contact information. So our medical director for myself. Uh, this is a typo. Actually, this should be QI director, excuse me. Uh, and then Derek Andrews and our program manager. So if you have any questions, follow-up questions after this presentation, uh, feel free to send them along to one of us. And uh, particulars about how to contact us, you know, we'll come out to you before the race. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, any questions? Um, Adam, I was just wondering, you know, when when somebody does send that first email, is there something that you often wish they would included that they don't think to write down? Yeah, that's a good question. And actually, I was realizing as I was coming to the end of my presentation that I didn't include a slide about that. Um, so the um, the we often get sort of one liners as a start that say, you know, uh, someone has a headache. Can we have some recommendations? So um, we're, we're always going to want to know name, date of birth, uh, prior medical problems, um, medications taken routinely, and allergies. And then beyond that, um, any particulars about the problem. So how long has the problem been going on? What was the person doing when the problem started? Oh, and a set of vitals, I, I forgot to mention. Um, you know, if you, if you have an emergency and you don't have time to get them, that's fine. But if you can send us temperature, pulse ox, pulse, blood pressure with that initial email, we'd love to hear that. And then anything else that you can tell us about the problem. So how long it's been going on, if they've ever had it before, if they have had it before, what the resolution was and how it was managed. Um, but usually what we'll do after the initial email is send back a series of questions uh, that are very specific. And the question, and you know, then uh, responses might allow us to create a treatment plan, or we might say, this is a little uh, complicated. Let's see if we can set up a phone call, if possible. Great. Um, some people had questions about the specific contact info and extending coverage for the return voyage, but I think that those will be things that we'll communicate through the PAC Cup um, as we work out the details. With, yeah. Um, MMA. Yeah. That's fair. Um, and somebody does, does mention that in 2018, they were able to forward basic medical information to George Washington for you to have on file. Is that possible this year as well? Um, I think it will be. I actually, to be honest with you, I don't know the particulars uh, of how things are going to be structured, but that will be, you know, that'll be clear before the race. Okay, we'll make sure um, as the Pacific Cup board that that is all clearly communicated, because yeah. this is an awesome service and we want you all to be able to take as much advantage of it as possible for sure. Then I have one last question. Um, Going back to rehydration, somebody was saying that they've seen recipes for homemade oral rehydration solutions with water and sugar and salt. Um, are these acceptable or would it just be better to get those uh, tablets you had mentioned? I think it would be better to, to do something commercially. I, I think I'm going to put this sort of in the same category of, um, you know, I'm not going to endorse a specific service or product. I think there are probably good uh, you know, homemade recipes out there. Um, but there are other things that you probably wouldn't want to have. And um, it's, it's really better to just 
you know, buy a commercial product that's balanced, it's cheap, you know, you're getting the right thing. Be great. Well, thank you for spending your time with us tonight. And um, yeah, if anybody has follow up questions, I think they can reach out to you at that email. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I will say, I, I, I will say, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a practicing emergency physician, you know, I have, you know, shifts in the ER, sometimes I'm asleep during the day. I, I, uh, you know, if you do send me an email, I'm, I've definitely gotten it. I will definitely respond to it. But especially after a presentation like this, sometimes I get a lot. So it might take a little while. Just be patient. Great. Well, luckily, nobody has an emergency yet. So yeah. now, well, and, and if and if they do, that's a very different process. <laughs> sure. Then I'll get a quick response. Great. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Yeah. Take care. Good night. All right.